Journey IFC strives to create safe spaces to worship God. Know that you are welcome just as you are, regardless of religious background or lack thereof, skin color, political affiliation, sexuality, age, culture, or any other label you own or society throws on you. You are welcomed and celebrated here just as you are. Our story today comes from the beginning of the book of Exodus, uh, which um, is a story of the Israelites' enslavement under the Egyptians, and ultimately their liberation and freedom from oppression. Today we're going to focus right at the beginning of this story, before we get to Moses, in fact, the reason we actually get to Moses, um, and we're going to focus our attention on two midwives named Shifra and Pua, um, and um, it's, it's a really good story I'm excited to share with you. Now a new king arose over Egypt. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them. Who says that? <laughs> Let's deal shrewdly with them. Or they will increase and in, in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians subjected the Israelites to hard servitude and made their lives bitter with hard servitude and mortar and bricks and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua. When you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it's a son, kill him. But if it's a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? And get this, this is what they say. The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwives come to them. <laughs> what a great response. They're just really good at birth and we're, they're too fast. <laughs> so God dealt with the midwives and the people, well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Um, this story is uh, an interesting story. We picked it several weeks ago. Um, our assault team had an open week, and I said I wanted one of my friends to come and talk, Stephanie Shoemaker. Um, and I asked her, Who? What biblical woman would you like to talk about? And she said, Shifra and Pua. So about maybe a month ago, we, we planned this, not knowing what would happen this week, and that we would be reading a story about women saving the lives of children um, in, a, in a week where the same thing happened in Uvalde. Um, so know that this is a heavy week, um, and if you need to cry with tissues, if you need to step out, it's okay. Um, but Stephanie, um, it's even, it feels like a Holy Spirit thing. Stephanie, she worked in Uvalde as a kind of supply pastor for our campus minister who's currently working there. And like I said, she's preaching there this morning. Um, and so she's in Boulder, Colorado. And whenever she heard the news, she booked a flight and got there as fast as she could. Um, and so she's been caring for families there. Um, and so, yeah, it felt like a Holy Spirit thing that this was planned. Um, and we talked last night and recorded this. And it was 35 minutes, and I got it down to 20 minutes, but it, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, and so, yeah. And Stephanie will explain all of the story more. I'm going to stop talking and hand it over to her with her video. Hey, Journeyers. I'm here with Pastor Stephanie Shoemaker, who's my friend from college. She actually is serving as a pastor in Boulder, Colorado now I'm at Atonement Lutheran Church, Boulder, Colorado. So... Stephanie, we're excited to have you. You've had a crazy week. Um, Stephanie, we'll probably talk about this more, but she's actually in Uvalde right now, um, helping at a church there um, with our former campus minister, Jenny Norris Lane, um, who's serving at the as a pastor in Uvalde Presbyterian Church. Um, so Stephanie, I'll ask you, give a little intro 
about yourself, whatever labels, identity markers you want to introduce yourself with. Um, Journey is excited to have you here. So thank you. I'm Stephanie. I use pronouns like she, her, hers, and um, I'm a native of San Antonio. Jacob and I met at Shriner when we were working in campus ministry together, um, and I went to seminary at the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago. Um, some other notable markers I think about me as I introduce myself is in 2019, I joined the Air Force as a chaplain candidate. Um, for the last two years, as Jacob said, I was working as a um, like a, we call it like a permanent pulpit supply here in New Valley. So the days that Reverend Jenny Norris Lane couldn't make it, I would come in and um, help out. So um, that's why I journeyed back from Colorado. I was literally at my first call or my first uh, in Boulder, my first job um, for like two weeks <laughs> before um, this unfortunate event happened. So um, my church was very understanding of my connection to New Valley and the, the, grief I was experiencing and said, like, go to your people. So it's been a heavy week. Um, but I think grief is more beautiful in community and, um, less hard. So I'm thankful that they welcomed me back for the time being. Um, the care is like more expansive than one can imagine, um, in that sense. And since Uvalde is such a small community, um, there's not one person who hasn't been affected. Yeah. Well, I want to say from people who wish they could do something and are really stuck in the grief that we just want to say thank you for showing up. Um, Cause I think the whole country and the whole world is looking at like, we wish we could be there. And so thank you for being the feet on the ground. Um, oh, goodness. Yeah. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. And thank you all for holding us in prayer and thoughts um, and not physically coming at times because the line at Whataburger gets too long and it makes <laughs> It makes the grief more compounded because then I have to wait longer for, for my meal. <laughs> Just yeah, kidding. For your, for um, your taquito, but, your late night taquito. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Journeyers. We appreciate that. So our first question for you, Stephanie, is why did you choose this story of Shifra and Pua uh, when you were asked what women in the Hebrew Bible you connected with? Thank you, Jacob, um, for the question. I feel like I'm on Miss America right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I took a women preaching, preaching women class when I was a senior in seminary. And um, I'm not a, a Bible scholar by any means. I was a public health major um, in pre-med in college, really kind of started getting into the Bible and historical critical context when I first started seminary. So this story was unknown to me for a, a long time. Um, and when I heard of these women, um, these defiant women, these women um, who are willing to put their lives on the line um, for the sake of the vulnerable, for the disenfranchised babies. Um, it was just like, was so liberating in a story where I think I felt seen and where my story of discernment and of call um, felt like inspired and lifted up. Um, and I think like having a medical connection as well. I worked as an EMT for six years, um, both prior to seminary and in seminary and thinking of ways I have felt like I've liberated people um, like through my vocation as an EMT, it's not like I was never not ministering spiritually. And I think um, when I think about Shipra and Pua and their just in their like vocation as midwives, it wasn't just birthing babies uh, or holding women's hands. They were providing physical support, emotional support, spiritual support. I definitely think there's times in healthcare where ethics get called into consideration. Um, and as a chaplain in CPE at a children's hospital, we were the in-house ethicist all of the time. And Shipra and Pua, I think are one of the first examples we have of medical ethics um, and of what it means to advocate for patients um, in the Old Testament. So um, their ministry is just so incredible and I think can be used in such a variety of ways um, to model liberation and um, advocacy. And what, what part, parts of this story intrigue you? I think um, it was the disobedience of the midwife. So when I was in seminary, we studied and practiced civil disobedience and community organizing on the streets of Chicago um, that looked like fighting for bail bonds, um, you know, following the murder of George Floyd. Like, what does it look like to represent um, the disenfranchised? What does it look like to give your, to use your power, um, to help the disenfranchised without having like a white savior complex? Um, that's like one thing. So, um, I think it was 
the women's disobedience, but then like the trickery that they used through their disobedience. It wasn't just them being defiant in a way where, um, like they could have been called like, you're a bitch, Shipra and Pua, like, um, don't be defiant to me. They did it in a way where Pharaoh thought they were doing what he wanted them to do. Um, and like that, I just love the trickstery that the women used. <laughs> That's yeah, I would call it like their wisdom, you know? Yes. Yes. Um, it's, it was just like the fact that they were able, you know, Pharaoh thought the women were dumb and useless. And that's why he wanted the males to be, to be killed, to be murdered. Um, Cause he does, he didn't see women as a threat. And um, these women were a threat. I don't know. I think that like in the military, I feel that all the time I feel underestimated by men that are in command around me. And um, like, once again, these women inspire me to um, kind of outwit um, and disprove the narratives that some of the men carry about women and, and our internal um, womanhood. <laughs> so how do you relate to Shifra and Pua? What about them do you connect with? That's a great question. I think they remind me um, to question those in authority. I think growing up in Southwest Texas, um, it's so ingrained to hear an order, whether from someone higher than you, whether it be of age, um, at a job, like whatever makes them of a higher status socially, I'm like, yes, ma'am yes, sir. Like, and especially in the military, like you receive an order and you do it. And it took me a long time to realize like, it's okay to question, um, those in authority, even when it, like a teacher, it's okay to question, um, a boss, even all the way down to law enforcement. It's like, you have to question, um, you can't blindly follow orders. And, um, like on a, on a micro level, I think uh, in my everyday life, they um, remind me to question the norm. What are we doing as a community to bring about the kingdom of God um, and not to blindly follow um, those around me, not to find, fo- blindly follow scripture. Um, I think scripture needs to be questioned. Um, I think religious scholars need to be questioned um, and just to like question everything um, and to you know really trust your gut. In your opinion, how does this story inspire persistence, especially among women? Mm. Ooh, that's a great question. Like, nevertheless, she persisted. Um, And I would like question back this question. So I'm not going to answer the question, but I'm going to answer it through another question. Um, Once again, like these women remind me to ask. Like, why should, why is it that we have to keep persisting? Never, never like, I think of the quote I just shared, um, nevertheless, she persisted. Um, but what about like breaking open the patriarchy and dismantling um, gender norms so we don't have to persist? So we're finally like on equal rights, equal levels. We have autonomy of our bodies. Like, what if it were the men who persisted? <laughs> the persistence of like not taking no for an answer and not, um, agreeing with the narratives that you're being told. So like, again, um, the women were being told a narrative by someone in power and they persisted, um, in their pursuit of love of God and fear of God, the fear that Shipra and Pua had, um, wasn't a fear of like, um, God will rain down on us. It was a fear of disappointment, um, a fear of loving God so much, and knowing that what Pharaoh was asking would not bring about God's kingdom um, and was not, would not, it would break God's heart. I love the idea of like, why do women have to persist when they could simply exist? Like I yeah, love <laughs> yes, exactly. I have not heard of that one, but. The... <laughs> yeah, well, I got it from you. So you were saying it. <laughs> <laughs> how is the spirit talking through me? <laughs> um, how does this story inform your ministry and your ministry is vast. You've done, like you said, a lot of stuff with EMT work. You worked at SeaWorld. You've done stuff with horse wrangling. You've done <laughs> everything. Um, but I'm interested, how does this inform the ministry, your chaplaincy, how you show up in the world? Hmm. Um, with Shifra and Pua, I think their vocation as midwife is what informs my ministry the most. Um As a preacher, I'm birthing the word of God to my congregation every Sunday. Um, Sacramentally, I think about um, opportunities for birth, um, which is 
you know, baptism, uh, Eucharist or communion, um, and even like taking confirmands on a retreat. Like I just, I try to look at every moment I have with my parishioners, um, every opportunity of relationship building being an opportunity of birth within their relationship. Um, and I get like just faith journey in general. Um, I don't think faith is like a destination. It's a continuous windy, sometimes you, um, turn journey. Um, like to call I, it my church an imperfect <laughs> journey. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, and I think about, um, I think of myself as a spiritual midwife. Um, and I wish I could claim that instead of pastor or chaplain. Um, what does it look like to be a coach? What does it look like to be a healer, um, to be an advocate, uh, to be someone who offers medicinal spirituality um, in the sense of mind, body, spirit, everything being connected. And the way that Shifra and Pua lived out vocation and faith, I mean, that's like the point of vocation is how to live out one's faith in their job, Hmm. but they did that so beautifully. And I think it's such, it's such an illustration, um, of Martin Luther, who is a theologian in the Lutheran church, um, an illustration of what true vocation is, how to, um, bring about Jesus's liberation, even though this is the old Testament, um, how to like act as a liberator for the disenfranchised. And that's exactly what they were doing as midwives who would have thought like, and, like neonatal mortality or, um, you know, like infant mortality was so high back then. No one would question children dying. Um, and these women did. And these women said, like, this is not what God would want. Um, like, let's liberate, liberate these women. Let's liberate these children. Um, they deserve a chance. Children are being harmed every day. I saw it, you know, even before a mass shooting I, in the hospital every day. And our systems to protect these children are broken and no one wants to address the systems or the laws in place. They instead just want to say like these poor children, um, instead of making change and Shifra and Pua didn't say like, Oh, these poor children, they said, we're going to change the systems. Like we're going to fight the systems. We're going to disobey the systems. And I love that they changed the system from the, like it says, like, you know, they were on the birth stool, like, they changed it from the in the midst of the messy humanity, like mm-hmm. the birthing, all of all of the stress and scariness, but also the like humanness of a birth. Mm-hmm. That's what inspired them. I love that. So I'm interested. How does this story speak into the world today, but in particular to your context in New Valdi right now? The story of Shifra and Pua. There's narratives being shared about certain people, mm-hmm. um, and it was up to the women to discern the truth in the narratives. Um, and every story has truth. Every story comes from a social location and a place. And you can't tell someone that their like experience in life or their social location is false. Um, so as I'm hearing more and more stories, um, I think like these women have inspired me to listen with a keen eye um, and to get, again, like question, listen for truth. Um, and listen how to bring liberation from, and not even liberation, but just like maybe resurrection um, from the grief. Not that we're trying to get to the cross too early. Um, You have to sit in the pain and the lament for a while. Um, Mm -hmm. And as more and more stories of coming out um, with what had happened that day, you're hearing more and more stories of um, heroes, just normal parents who one minute we're eating lunch and the next we're running into a building with an active shooter, not, you know, not caring of themselves at all. Um, and I think these women had a greater calling and a greater sense. Um, I mean, these women were heroes to these children, um, and they were putting their lives at risk by disobeying Pharaoh. Um, and the women on Tuesday morning, you know, or putting their lives at risk to save their children. Um, so, and I, I, everyone that day was putting their life at risk, whether it was the parents or whether it was law enforcement first responders. Um, and I think like lifting up everyone's social location on Tuesday morning, um, whether like they're not being casted as the bad guy or the good guy. And that's important to remember, I think in our story, it's easy to like frame Pharaoh as a horrible person, which maybe he was, 
Um, but at the end of the day, like Brera was also a child of God. Um, these police officers were also are also children of God. As we look at scripture, I think it's important to also like place the context. And as you say, like as many times as the voices of women are left out, like there, there are so many voices that are left out Mm -hmm. and the affect of the voices are left out. Um, so who, like, I think like, that's what's so dangerous about scripture and what can be so dangerous about these, um, unnatural events is the narratives, you know, and we're given the narrative of the story, but we, and the story sounds bad. We're asking for these women to kill babies, but um, we are, we miss a lot of context. And who knows if all, like all of what was happening? Maybe Pharaoh really was upset, um, and this was felt like it was his only way. And what would it look like to think about Pharaoh telling the women through teary eyes? Um, mm. So I don't know. Once again, like question everything. Yeah. Um, question what is being like question what our community leaders are telling the community here in Uvalde and question what scripture is telling us in the story of Shafra and Pua. Give yourself time to speak um, for the voices or the stories not being told and like imagine who is missing at the story and and that can be like a community organizing tool as well that you you're, you get taught in community organizing. Anytime you're sitting at a table of people, look around and say, who's missing from this table? Are women missing? Are people of color missing? Are trans LGBTQA plus people missing? And um, so that has nothing to do with Shepherd and Pua though, but. Oh, but it, oh, at a sense it does. <laughs> and I think it also has to do with what you're doing in Uvalde is you're showing up and you're holding space for all of these stories. Like, all the different kinds of grief. And that's, you know, you get on social media right now and it's people throwing fingers, but you're just sitting in the midst of, you're on the birth stool. You're like right there in the mess of it. um, And you're lifting up the stories um, and caring for everyone. And I love that. Thank you. And I think that's also important. Like Shifra and Pua didn't blame religion or Pharaoh's belief system as to what caused the hurt. Um, I think they just saw it as like, what, what it was, which is just humanness at the end of the day, like let's all unite with humanity and not like let religion or beliefs or um, like, like your, like your social location, like let that go aside and let's just all remember that we bleed the same blood and we all breathe the same air um, and have that be the uniting factor. Um, in response to this story and everything you've seen in Uvalde, which has been touching to hear about Um, and I would love to hear more about another time. Uh, What's a word of blessing or hope or or maybe just a word, it doesn't even have to be that, that you could offer to Journey, maybe to yourself, to the world, to Uvalde, whatever you need to. What's a word that you could offer? You know, I really hope um, this conversation and this story, um, like I hope the good news that came out of it is birthing resistance and um, I hope it has planted a seed um, of resistance and of birth um, and just ways that um, you can birth new things in your community. You can birth new things in your relationships with other people. Um, and then through the systems that you exist in ways um, that you can be defiant um, and continue to question narratives and the norm. Um, and through the questioning, through the defiancy, like birth new life um, and birth new ways of thinking and birthing new ways that bring about love and not hate. Cause that's where Shifra and Pua were operating out of was love, love mm-hmm. for neighbor, um, love for the marginalized, love for the disenfranchised. And Thank you so much. And we just pray blessings on you that in this, I know you're there till Monday that um, you can continue to show up, but you can also get space to grieve um, for yourself. Um, But thank you. We send our love to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Journey. I appreciate again um, the time you are taking and the intentional listening of my story and um, of these incredible women. So I hope you continue to be Shifra and Pua out in your worlds in Austin. Amen. Thank you, Stephanie. Speaking of meeting Shifra and Pua, um, we have here today with us, my friend, Margaret Burns, who um, 
Uh, I met in seminary. We just happened, not incidentally, <laughs> to sit next to each other one day in class. And I don't know what exactly happened between us because it was just in a few minutes before class. And it just changed both of us. There was just such a bond. And um, Margaret has had a long career and broad experience as a midwife. But more than that, Margaret has been destroyed multiple times. And I have witnessed some of these times. Um, when she stopped being a midwife, it was a terrible destruction. And she has gotten up and continued to minister. She has centered herself. She has traveled to find other wisdom. She has absorbed, she has questioned everything. Her vocabulary about faith, I guarantee you, is different than yours. <laughs> she has so much to offer us. And right now, she is in a moment of destruction again. And in that moment, she has come to share what she has with us. Thank you so much. Um, you know, Gail kind of midwifed me through seminary, so um, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I think that sometimes the path of a midwife is the birth spiral. All babies are born through a spiral, the pelvic bones. And the spiritual aspect of that is that, yes, I, there have been so many times where I feel like I've lost everything and I've come back. I've lost everything and I've come back. Um, so I just want to start by saying that I'm sending love to all the mamas. All the mamas have felt this. It's in our mitochondrial DNA. And um, I'm sending all, all of my love to the mamas. Um, so I want to start by saying that birth stools are still in use. Um, they're amazing, <laughs> amazing things to help with the birth process. Um, I think that what midwives do best is preserve women's wisdom um, against factors that I think midwives feel have been up against women since these times, right? Um, even within the United States, for instance, the systematic sterilization of both men and women of color. So we're talking about so many, you know, thousands of years of trying to control um, women in this way. And when I do think of this story, I think of just knowing that the wisdom of those women's bodies was that fetal ejection reflex. Those midwives were there protecting that, knowing that those women, it was time. They knew it was time. It was time to give birth then. That was what they knew they needed to do. And their wisdom of their bodies was, was going to kick in, be present, but it was, it was held by, by the midwives around them who could do that. So midwives are always sort of holding space, right? Holding space for, for, that, for that wisdom to happen, that wisdom to come through the body. Um, and I love how midwives were like the first act of the civil disobedience <laughs> that God wants yeah. for us. Um, and so what I, I want us to consider is 
Where are the patriarchal structures that are holding us back? Where are the patriarchal structures that are holding back um, the wisdom of, of women? It's really important to feel into this because um, these things these things affect us today, right? These things affect us today. Um, I I used to when I would get asked to speak about being a midwife, would start by saying, uh, "My name is Margaret. I'm a midwife, and I'm illegal in 39 states." <laughs> so, um, and this was about a decade ago when I was practicing, um, but that just was sort of my opener to to assume that I could legally and help a woman birth a baby um, in the United States is false. And I think that it's, um, if we have to talk about questioning law, that um, it's it's um, a good question to ask. You know, why, why would that have been illegal in 39 states? <laughs> um, so the most important thing, again, I feel like is to, is to question um, to continue to question and to continue to understand that we're at a time where women's wisdom is being devalued and underestimated still. Um, and there's a systematic dismantling of it where I feel like that could be, that could be as heavy as it gets. So I want to welcome, welcome your questions to me about birth, about how to hold space, about how to support. Good question. Yes. We'll see if the mic so the Zimmers can hear. Um, yes. Was there anything that um, Stephanie said that you were like, yes, like that is, that's what it feels like? Was there anything that spoke to you then? Yes, again, like this, um, this real like need to get in there and provide midwifery on the spiritual level, on the level of body, on the level of mind, and um, be supportive in, in all ways, and to to do that in in a, in a way where if if that means that you're you're kind of going against a, a larger system, you you never question that, you you never think about that. You're not afraid. You're afraid. You're afraid of God. You work in birth. You're gonna be afraid. Of God. <laughs> you know, God is God is in charge of that process. Um, God is giving giving the the spirit to to <laughs> to women in those moments, and you you would never be af afraid of of um, of a structure, a patriarchal man made structure after that. Anybody on Zoom have a question? Um, Hang on, we need to get you some Zoomers in here. I know that um, I did natural childbirth with both of my children, but with doctors and in the hospital. And, uh, but that experience changed me giving birth changes the woman. And um, and there's something, I don't know how to ask the question, I don't know exactly what it is, but grief is like that too. And it changes us. Um, but how has it made you more uh, wise or compassionate when you're going through, when something is trying to be born in you, and the world or the system is not allowing you to do it the way your own body wants to do it. I feel like that all the time. <laughs> um, especially in, in the work that I do now, um, I've been practicing um, since I, I stopped practicing as, as a midwife. Um, I practice as an herbalist and hands-on healer, um, and still feel like I'm overregulated. <laughs> so yeah, um, I think about that a lot. But on the level of of spirit, 
even if the anger comes up and the, the holy rage that would propel me to keep going. Um, what I know is, is every time I'm confronted with that, it's, it's always about how, how much I can keep my heart open and how courageously I can keep my heart open and not close it. The bigger that the heart, we say the heart field is open, the more that we have to feel everything. We can't selectively numb, right? So the more we allow that love in is sort of the more that everything else also comes in, comes through. So we, what we want to do is get good at, at allowing that, that open, that heart field to stay open. Allowing that heart field to stay open, honestly, it's the same thing as allowing more wisdom to come through here. And that's right, so I talk about this a lot too, that there's this, there's the channel. Sometimes we talk about it more in the, in the feminine body, but it's the, the channel, the wisdom, the heart, and then the birth. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I love you all so much. How do I get a blessing out of this? Well, I don't, but God does. You are urged by our loving creator not to listen to the talking heads of the day that divide us. Sit in your grief, in your reconciliation. Do what that wonderfully created heart tells you to do. Be not be divided. Do not be overcome. Persist in this world of division, and in it you'll be united. And that's the blessing comes. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeff.